Good morning. Welcome to worship at Calvary United Methodist Church, where we live faithfully, love deeply, and serve sacrificially. I'm Bill Meisch, the pastor here at Calvary, and it's my joy and privilege to welcome you. Today, we finish the second part of our congregational journey into answering the question, who are we? I invite you to open your heart and your mind and allow the presence of the Holy Spirit into your life so that we together may glorify God. Good morning, everyone. Today we wrap up the second of our six-week church-wide studies on who are we, where we've been looking for the past six weeks at who we are as United Methodists looking at the things that unite us as a denomination and that bind us together as a body of believers. And through it all, it has been and continues to be our fervent prayer that God will indeed make us one. Make us one, make us one, make us one, undivided body, make us one, make us one, for the sake of your name, make us one. Make us love, make us love, make us love, so the world will know we love you. Make us love, make us love, for the sake of your name, make us love. us pure, make us pure, make us pure and righteous, make us holy, make us pure, make us pure, for the sake of your name, make us pure. Make us one, make us one, make us one, undivided body, make us one, make us one, for the sake of your name, make us one. For the sake of your name, till you come, for the sake of your name, make us one. Amen. Good morning, Calvary kids. I'm excited to be here with you this morning. And I wanna remind you to go by the church today and pick up your Sunday School to Go packets. Um, the February ones have hit the cart this morning. Um, and we're gonna focus on Lent and Show Tuesday and Ash Wednesday and how to prepare for Easter. That 40 days from Shrove Tuesday pancake dinner till uh, Easter Sunday. But let's move on to our lesson. We are still working, all the adults in the church are working on this study. Who are we? And this lesson today that Pastor Bill is going to talk about talks about the work we still have to do. And in the part of that, it talks about how we find ways to find our differences, right? So, like these these crayons. What, what, what about them? Are these markers not crayons? 
We got a green one, we got an orange one. I got a little bit different shade green and black and purple and blue and red. So they're different, right? Mm, not really that much, are they? They're more alike than they are different. They all color, they all make things pretty. They're all fun to use. The only thing that's different is the color of them, right? Why do we feel that sometimes we need to figure out the differences of things, right? Like if you look at somebody and they might look a little different than you or act a little different, but then you get to know them and you're like, oh, he likes soccer just like I do. Or she takes dance just like I do. Or we both love to play the same video game. So the differences don't always need to be what we focus on. We are stronger when we find our similarities and how we can work as a team. And that reminded me about string. String's not very strong by itself. This one's a green one. I'm not very strong myself, but I probably could break this if I wanted. And then I've got a, a blue one and an orange one. Now, if I take each of these strings by themselves, they're not very strong, right? But if I take each of them and braid them together, they become stronger. So let's see. What once was weak becomes stronger as we intertwine them with each other. We make them one. We use the fact that they're all the same because they're all string, but they're all a little different because they got a little bit of different uh, texture to them, uh, color to them. But when I braid them together and make them into one, they're stronger, right? So we're better if we work as a team, right? Your soccer team's much better if you're working with the player to the right. Or your baseball team's much better if you have all nine players on the field. So we have to start looking at how things are the same and how we can be better together. That's the hard thing to do. It's easy to find our differences. It's harder to look deeper and find how we can work together as a team. Take a, have a great week. Dear Lord, thank you for your many gifts. Help us to always keep love for you and for others in our hearts as you have loved us. Please grant us humility, gentleness, and patience, and grant us peace, filling us with your Holy Spirit so that we may be unifiers and peacemakers in our hearts, our church, our community, and the world. We ask your healing for those suffering from cancer, COVID, injury, mental health struggles, and loneliness. Comfort us in loss. We ask your protection for those who are vulnerable or in danger. Surround them, Lord, with your angels. Where there is darkness, Lord, shine your light, sending us, Lord, when it is your will, helping each of us to be worthy of your call. Please bless our leaders with wisdom, compassion, and your guidance. Bless our loved ones in care homes and hospitals. Please watch over those serving our country in the military, medical settings, workplaces, and churches. We ask this all in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture for today is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, and 11 to 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. 
Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning, we continue with our churchwide study, Who Are We? A Journey from Head to Heart. This week, we complete the second part of this three-part journey. This study explores our identity as Methodists shaped in the Wesleyan tradition and practices. And while our Christian identity is rooted in our understanding of God and in following Jesus, There are unique Wesleyan ways of experiencing and expressing our Christianity. Today, we focus on Paul's plea for unity within the church and how we as United Methodists have found Paul's plea difficult to realize. On Paul's second missionary journey, almost 20 years after Jesus died and was resurrected, He visited Ephesus, which was a a metropolis on the western shore of modern-day Turkey, and founded a church there. Ephesus was, at that time, a center for fertility goddess worship, uh, the Roman goddess Diana or the Greek goddess Artemis. And the Temple of Artemis, or Diana, in Ephesus could accommodate over 24,000 persons and was also one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Pagan practices abounded in Ephesus, centered around fertility rites and temple priestesses. Two or three years later, Paul returned to Ephesus on his third missionary journey, and he stayed there for a few years, teaching the gospel of Jesus, weeding out false doctrines that had crept in, and offering an alternative to the city's pagan practices, which were based on physical love, and he substituted for that spiritual love. Paul taught in the school of Tyrannus there in Ephesus, and he encouraged his followers in the teaching of Jesus. And he formed a new community of people whose lifestyle contrasted with that of the physical excesses of the followers of Diana or Artemis. For the next decade, that church grew, nurturing the fruit of the Holy Spirit and welcoming visits from Timothy and Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos. It was toward the close of this period that Paul sent a letter to the Ephesians commending their faithfulness and love for one another and the sincerity of their community in following Jesus. For several decades following, the church of Ephesus continued to grow and thrive in the midst of the city's strong pagan influence. Paul's letter praises the church in Ephesus for bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And Paul goes on to write, the church's ongoing work is 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Did you notice that Paul uses the word unity in ways that are different than how we use that word today. To Paul, unity means possessing the same spirit and sharing the bond of peace, being one in faith and of the knowledge of Jesus, reaching maturity as followers or emulators of Christ, and speaking truth in love as we grow up in every way through love. For Paul, unity is not doing a mind meld around human opinion. Rather, it's merging our spirits in a way that transforms and joins all people together in mutual love through Christ Jesus. As the Methodist denominations that split over slavery in the mid-1800s entered the 20th century, conversations of reunification began. For the first decades of the 20th century, equal but separate or racial segregation was the law of the land. The myth was that the races were separate but were provided equal facilities and equal opportunities under the law. In reality, no one really believed it. In the years immediately prior to the reunification of the Methodist Episcopal, Methodist Episcopal South, and Methodist Protestant churches, racial segregation was welcomed by all of these denominations. This was not just something embraced by the churches, it was embraced by our society writ large. For example, in 1930, black persons were 42% of the Florida population. A 1936 Florida government report cited that white school properties in the state were valued at over $70,500,000 while the value of all African-American school properties were valued at $4,900,000. African-American schools, it turns out, were housed in churches, shacks and lodges with no toilets, no water supply and no desks or blackboards. In 1939, the salary of a white Florida high school teacher was $1,148, while the salary of a black high school teacher was $585. Hardly separate, but equal. Hardly Paul's idea of unity. And yet, <clears throat> in 1939, under the illusion that the law of separate but equal was just, the Methodist Episcopal, Methodist Episcopal South, and Methodist Protestant churches reunited by segregating Negroes into a central jurisdiction of that Methodist church. So it was really just white Methodists who reunited, forcing black Methodists to occupy a separate but equal structure where never the twain would meet. The structure was intentionally as unequal between whites and blacks as it was in the rest of America's segregationist culture. The Central Conference was and is a dark stain at best on the history of the Methodist denomination, considering John Wesley's adamant stance against slavery and for true equality among all persons. Clearly, Wesley's concept of a church uniting all people in Jesus Christ had lost its way. 
beginning in 1954. <clears throat> a series of Supreme Court decisions found segregation as separate but equal to be unconstitutional. In the following years, segregation faltered after a series of integrating acts generated national upheaval. In 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat in the colored section to a white man on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, after the whites only section had filled up, thus resisting bus segregation. On September 23, 1957, Nine black students were the first to be integrated into an all-white Little Rock, Arkansas high school. A year later, the governor of Arkansas closed all three high schools in Little Rock instead of yielding to federal orders to integrate, with white students attending private all-white academies instead. All grades in the Little Rock school system weren't fully integrated until 1972. In 1962, James Meredith became the first black person to attend the University of Mississippi in Oxford under federal law enforcement and military presence. And an ensuing riot resulted in two deaths and over 300 serious injuries. In 1967, the Supreme Court ruled that Virginia's law against interracial marriage was unconstitutional. Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote in the majority opinion, under our constitution, the freedom to marry or not marry a person of another race resides with the individual and cannot be infringed by the state. On April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, with race riots erupting in over 100 major U.S. cities in the aftermath. And in that same month, on April 23rd, 1968, the Methodist and Evangelical United Brethren Churches unified in Dallas, Texas at the United Methodist Churches Unifying Conference. The new United Methodist Church ended the segregation of black congregations in the former Methodist Church by abolishing the central jurisdiction, but only after the 750,000 member Evangelical United Brethren Church forced the 10 plus million member Methodist Church to stop its segregationist policies. And still, the church struggles to attain a level of spiritual unity that Paul described to the church in Ephesus. John Wesley's sermon on Catholic spirit echoes Paul's letter. Wesley wrote, By unity, I do not mean be of my opinion. He did not. I do not expect or desire it. Neither do I mean I will be of your opinion. I cannot. It does not depend on my choice. I can no more think than I can see or hear, as I will. But if you love God with all and all humanity, I ask no more. Give me your hand. I mean, first, love me. Love me with a very tender affection as a friend that is closer than a brother. As a brother in Christ a fellow citizen of the New Jerusalem, a fellow soldier engaged in the same warfare under the same captain of our salvation. Love me as a companion in the kingdom and patience of Jesus and a joint heir 
of his glory. I mean, secondly, commend me to God in all your prayers. Wrestle with God on my behalf, that God would speedily correct what God sees amiss and supply what is wanting within me. I mean, thirdly, provoke me to love and to good works. And I mean, lastly, love me not in word only, but in deed and in truth. So far as in conscience you can, retaining still your own opinions and your own manner of worshiping God, join with me in the work of God. And let us go on hand in hand. Powerful words from John Wesley. May we all understand Christian unity as Paul and Wesley did, as we offer our hearts and love and hands to each other in the name of Jesus Christ, including all and excluding none. May we bear with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace and justice. Amen. As we enter into this time of offering, I invite us to think a little bit differently today. It is the Christian tradition to tithe one's gifts and graces back to God in thanksgiving for all that God has given. So what might it look like for you to tithe your prayers, your presence, your gift, your service, and your witness back to God in thanksgiving for all that God has given to you. Traditionally, a tithe is defined as 10% of that which God has blessed us with. Perhaps for you, it's not quite at 10%, but what is a tithe to you? A faithful, regular, proportionate gift back to God in thanksgiving for what God gives to you each day, your life, your sustenance, your family, your relationships, and the salvation that is ours through Jesus Christ. I invite you to contemplate that this week. What does a tithe look like to you? And then think about how you can share your time your talent and your treasure with God through Calvary United Methodist Church. I invite you to look at Calvary's website where you will find ways that you can give financially as well as of your time and your talents. Thanks be to God for the gifts that we have all received. And may we all be faithful in giving thanks to the source of all our good.
As our time of worship ends this morning, we go out into service this week in the world, remembering that we are imperfect humans, but we have a God who through Jesus Christ forgives us, reconciles us and welcomes us forever into his presence. So go into the work this week, knowing that God loves you because God has made you and God has saved you through his son, Jesus Christ. And God continues to sustain you by the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Go in that knowledge and go in that love. Amen. Thank you.